Ready? Great. So welcome to this week's Topaz Colloquium. Today, we're delighted to welcome Moshe Vari. Um, Moshe has long been an inspiration to me for both his significant scientific work and for being a prominent community voice, reminding us to always pay attention to how our work as scientists intersects with our work as citizens. This same spirit underlies our, our mission at Topos, and it's on this latter theme that Moshe will speak to us today, um, ethics washing in AI. So please, Moshe. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you this morning. We talk a lot these days about ethics in AI. I want to talk about ethics washing in AI, and the title may be a little mysterious, but it will become clearer as I go along. So let me start with some, some background. So I'll go back to the very early, early days of AI. And one characteristic of these early days was, in fact, it also goes back to Turing himself, is optimism. How hard can this problem of artificial intelligence be? So 1958, which is pretty much the, you can say maybe the birth of AI as a, as a research area. Uh, Simon and Noel saying chess, how hard can chess be? Let's give it 10 years. Um, didn't take it. It took a bit longer than 10 years. And then uh, Marvin Minsky said, okay, within a generation, which will be maybe 30 years, okay. This problem is about, we are about to solve this problem. How hard can it be? Well, it turned out it was harder than people thought. And that led to waves of, there was optimism, and then there were wave of pessimism. And people call the wave of pessimism AI winters. And the two that was very prominent was the one in the 70s and then the one in the, in the mid to, to mid 80s to mid 90s. In both cases, there were periods in which uh, progress was slow, but even, even more was for academics, research funding was, was, was scarce. And so there was a vicious cycle. People did not, people were pessimistic and therefore there was no funding and therefore there was no progress. But um, I mean, when I, got a little bit into AI as a as young researcher. AI was a bit of a, almost an unsavory uh, a kind of connotation of an area that always over promises and under delivers. But then starting actually from 1997, there was kind of a, a sequence of breakthrough that kind of completely changed how we view AI. Today, I believe that about 80% of our incoming PhD students, when they say, what do they want to work on? They say AI, AI. So clearly a dramatic, dramatic change. And I'll go through these three milestones. And the first one was when IBM Deep, IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov in a chess tournament in 1997. And this I was involved in very personally in the following way. IBM invited me to come and attend. They, they were very confident of themselves, I think. So they invited me to and other people as well. In fact, they didn't just invite me to come. They paid my way to fly from Houston to New York and they uh, paid for the hotel. So I, I was not too excited, but I said, how can I not go if do all of this? So I went there and I watched the first game and Kasparov won the first game. And I told myself, okay, you know, one day computers will win, but I was not too op optimistic the time has come. And we are still fairly new in Houston and we didn't have any friends and I felt bad for leaving my wife kind of lonely. So I said, okay, I've watched one game, good enough. And I went back to Houston and I never stayed to watch the second game. The second game, Deep Blue was white, had the advantage and uh, it beat Kasparov. You could speak Kasparov after his, after conceding defeat, walking away with the, from the chess table when it was self-disgust. And he never recovered from that defeat and he went on to lose the tournament. And that was really, remember, people predicted it would take uh, uh, 10 years to do chess, to automate chess. Well, it took 30 years, but it was a huge milestone. Uh, the next milestone that, uh, again, I think was very significant is when IBM's Watson beat two great uh, Jeopardy players, Brad J Rader and, and, and Ken Jennings in, uh, in Jeopardy. And while chess was always clearly just a game of, of brute force, I mean, the whole point of Deep Blue was really about building a specialized machine that can search deeper in a search tree. Uh, Jeopardy requires natural language, you know, doing analogies, require a 
much richer, deeper level of AI. And people, many people, including me, viewed it as a greater accomplishment. In fact, IBM thought that they can make huge money on Watson, and it took them after that a decade before they considered failure of Watson as a business. And then a few years later, AlphaGo beat Lisa Doll in, uh, in Go. And this was considered to be a, a, a harder challenge because the game of Go was always considered more of a challenge because the, the board is larger and the pieces are uniform, just white and, white and black. So the configuration speed is much, much larger. And it's very clear, people realize that just the same thing that worked with Deep Blue, which is brute for search, will not work for AlphaGo, for, for the game of Go. And indeed, a DeepMind, the company, they did a, a great innovation, which is the combine search techniques with machine learning, with reinforced, reinforced learning. And the, first of all, they processed all the published games in Go, but then DeepMind played against itself millions of games. And this way, you know, now we don't have, it's not about boot for search, it's about AlphaGo developing intuition to how to play Go. And this is much closer to how Go masters play Go. They have an intuition for what is a good configuration, what is a bad configuration. So this was considered a huge progress in, uh, in AI being able to mechanize the game of Go. But this is, it, it, it really goes deeper than that because this addresses an old paradox in AI that was called known as Polanyi's paradox. And what was Polanyi's paradox? Polanyi's paradox was, we can know more than we can, than we can say. The skill of a driver cannot be replaced by, thor by thorough schooling in the theory of the motor car. So people thought Polanyi's paradox was, how can we, automate driving if the driver cannot explain exactly how, how they drive. You know, when you approach, think about it, you approach a red light and the light change, and you have to make a decision to drive through the yellow light or to, or to, or to slow down, and how to push the brake, and ask you, tell me exactly how you do that. Well, you can't. You just, you have an intuition. You learn by experience. You cannot try the rules. So how people thought, how can we write a program for that? And now we know the answer is use machine learning to learn how to drive. So this was really kind of the, a huge change in how people viewed what machine learning can accomplish. And in fact, many people predicted then a, 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 a soon to come transportation revolution. This is a picture of the, of the Waymo car. And it says, well, how hard now? The same way that people thought in the early days, how hard can chess be? By the after uh, in the mid to in the mid to uh, uh, 2010s, people thought, How hard can driving be? Well, it's a kind of a bit of the same thing. It turns out it's a bit that even though we're machine learning, it's a bit more difficult than we thought. And we start having an embarrassing thing. Tesla car hits a concrete barrier. So you have an SUV, it's semi autonomous, but people are, are using it to say to pay attention to, to watch videos, to play games. And then Tesla hit a uh, crash attenuate, attenuator, and it turns out that uh, this was really the, the, the fault of the, of, the, of the autopilot software of Tesla. And NTSB said in, in more than two years ago, they expect many more crashes to happen. And in fact, just recently we heard that hundreds of crashes every year are happening with the Tesla uh, auto, autopilot software. There is quite a way to go. And then things got worse in, uh, in the same year with Uber. Now we have that uh, you have a, a, an Uber car, autonomous AV, with a safety driver on board, but the safety driver is not paying attention. And a pedestrian is killed. And it turns out, we'll turn out later that, in fact, they've disabled the automatic brake because it, it caused too much uh, braking. And they did not have a safety plan in place and the driver was, was charged with homicide, but Uber somehow came up scot-free. So this started, uh, I would say, by around 2018, we started some disillusionment, the same way there was a wave of hype. And this is called the, the you know, there is the, what is it, the, the, the Gartner hype cycle. And now we seem to be kind of going down. And we said, well, maybe AVs are more difficult than we thought. 
But I would say beyond that, around the time, there was a wave of concerns about AI that started. I mean, what we are seeing now, all this uh, kerfuffle about census or whatever, this wave of, of disillusionment started in the 210s. For example, in, uh, in 2016, ProPublica does an expose about, uh, about machine learning that try to predict future criminals. And they take identical uh, dossiers, they just put some, some changes to make clear that one, one person is black and one person is white. And guess what? The machine learning program said it's biased against blacks. Why? Because we all know that. We have a history of prejudice against black in the United States. And if we used to say those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, now we're saying it's the other way is true. Those who learn from history, machine learning that learns from history is doomed to repeat it. So we have bias against blacks. And then in 2017, Cathy O'Neill came up with this important book, Weapons of Mass Destruction, how big data increases inequality and threaten democracy. A frightening look at how algorithm increasingly regulating people in, with, with many adverse consequences. And by the October of 2017, people start talking about the tech clash. And I first realized that something has changed in the perception of society, how society views technology, when I read a column by Peggy Noonan in the Wall Street Journal in October 2017. And she talked about an issue that's still very much uh, 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 on, our, on, our, on our horizon right now, very much so. In fact, more so because of the Supreme Court decision, I think, of today. She wrote about gun ownership, tried to explain why do people need to have to own gun. I think her, her argument is a, is a kokamami argument. But nevertheless, let's read the paragraph. Because all of her personal financial information got hacked in the latest breach, because our country's real overloads are in Silicon Valley and appear, appear to be moral Martians who operate on some weird new postmodern ethical wavelengths. And they, they will be the ones programming the robot that will soon take all of our jobs. So this is the tech clash, the, the, the backlash against technology. So that led to people talking more and more about ethics, ethics, ethics. So people start talking about the ethics crisis. So you see a whole bunch of headlines from, from, the, from, the, from mainstream media, New York Times, February 2018, take ethical dark side. Harvard and Stanford other want to address it. Boston Globe, March 2018, COVID-19 and face an ethics crisis. New York Times, October 2017, 2018. Something CEO, chief ethics officer, could help technology company navigate political and social questions. And, and then also in, in that year, Facebook cares so much about ethics, it gives seven and a half million dollars for a new institute for ethics in artificial intelligence. And textbook comes out. Now you can have a textbook, you can get a textbook by Mark Kockelberg on AI ethics, and where he argues that this, this and other AI application raise complex ethical issues that are the subject of ongoing debate. So we must talk about how to create ethical AI. And the Vatican got into the picture in February of 2020, the Pontifical, the Pontifical Academy for Life issues a wrong call, call for AI ethics and they have Microsoft, IBM, the Food and Drug Organization of the, of the United Nations, the Italian government, they signed this call for ethics. The value and principle they were able to instill in AI will help establish a framework that regulates and act as a point of reference for digital ethics. Ethics, ethics, ethics. And company says, oh, we care a lot about ethics. So we saw before that Facebook cared about ethics and they gave seven and a half million dollars for this new institute in AI, AI ethics. And Facebook has a page on responsible AI. The development of AI is creating new opportunities to improve the lives of people around the world, from businesses, business to healthcare to education. It also raises new questions about the best way to build fairness, interpretability, privacy, security into this system. So Facebook is another company that jumps on the AI wagon, AI ethics wagon. And we saw that uh, 
that uh, Facebook gave, gave the money in 2018 to Technical University in Munich. And the press release says at Facebook, ensuring the responsible and thoughtful use of AI is foundational to everything we do, from the data level we use to the in algorithm we build to the system they are part of. Everybody is so ethical. Google, Facebook. But then in 2018, a Dutch philosopher, Ben Wagner, writes an article, Ethics as an Escape from Regulation, from ethics washing to ethics shopping. And he coined the phrase ethics, ethics uh, washing. And he wrote, much of the debate about ethics seemed to provide an easy alternative government regulation. The industry loved to talk about ethics as, as a way to not talk about what he argued is the real issue is government regulation. So let's dig a little deeper into that. And I want to start with an analogy to the automobile. The automobile was the most significant technology of the 20th century. Yes, computers were born in the 20th century, and they may very well be the most significant technology of the 21st century, but the 20th century is the century of the automobile. And the Ford Model T, all of the manufacturing line in 1908 and became the first mass consume, mass produce automobile. Automobile itself goes back 50 years earlier in Europe, but Ford Model T became a hit. And as, as, as uh, automobile starts roaming the roads in the United States and in, in Europe, people get killed in car crashes. And we've spent the past 100 plus years trying to reduce the, the, the fatality rate. Now, transportation experts said, wait a minute, there are more cars, there are more people, so clearly the number of absolute death will increase. So the measure it, the most important measure is death per billion VMT. VMT is vehicles mile travel. Each time we drive in a billion miles, how many people will die? And you can see that we have actually reduced it by by a huge factor from almost 250, 100 years ago to just around uh, 10 today. So very, very significant reduction. How did you accomplish it? Well, by whole, by myriad me measures, not by single measure. Uh, building different the cars, we introduced mirrors. Mirrors were not there at the beginning. We introduced mirrors, uh, driver assistance, anti-lock airbags, uh, we change the way the city is configured, we have crosswalks, we have traffic lights, we have certain laws, DWI, DWT, driving while, while intoxicated, driving while, while texting, a, a driver in many cases have to have mandatory safety training. What did we not say? The solution is ethics training for drivers. No, we didn't say that. So we had public policy. And all these measures, all the way from how we build cars, to how we configure the city, to how we license driving, this is what I call public policy, okay? We a whole variety of different, different measures. We didn't say it's an ethical issue. Now let's go back to information technology, and AI. And let's talk about one important application, which is machine learning in the justice system. So in, in, in April 2017, Chief, Chief Justice John G. Roberts is visiting Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and he has a fireside chat with the president, Shirley Ann Jackson. And, he ask, and she asked him, can you foresee a day when smart machines driven with artificial intelligence says, I don't know why the plurals, will assist with quantum fact finding or more controversially even judicial decision-making. And, and Chief Justice Roberts says, it's a day that it's here and it's putting a significant strain on how judiciary goes about doing things. And notice kind of the, the, the passive way he's talking about it. It is happening. The New York Times wrote about this algorithm, an algorithm that grants freedom or takes it away. So today we found that machine learning is being used in many application justice system, deciding on bail, on sentencing, parole, separating children from parents. All of these are very, very difficult decisions. 
with profound implication for people's lives. And no wonder the judges have a difficult time making such decision. Why not delegate to the machine learning? So here's an opportunity for industry and companies, companies such as North Point, which I'm sure you never heard of, they jump into the fray and they have a beautiful website, talks about advancing justice and embracing community who can object to this to this to these things. Okay. But then we go back to what happened is that uh, some people call it the new Jim Crow. A recent, a recent, recent criminal justice reform contained the seal of fighting system of incarceration. These advanced mathematical models, she, she writes, appear colorblind on the surface, but are significantly influenced by pervasive bias in the criminal justice system. So, as we saw before, there's the there is historical bias in the in the U.S. justice system. If machine learning is is learned from this then it will be biased against, against uh, black defendants. So let's take a kind of a hypothetical example. Let's look, at, let's look at my dog, Fluffy. He's a black lab, very cute black, black lab. And I trained Fluffy to detect risk of recidivism. And I even took Fluffy to the, to the federal court system to, to check how accurate Fluffy is, and Fluffy is uncanny. You let him sniff someone. If he barks, there is a risk of recidivism. If he leaks, then there is very low risk of recidivism. But as you can see, Fluffy is a black box and does not provide explanations. So should we allow Fluffy to make parole decisions? And everybody will say, no, it's ridiculous. Should we give Fluffy ethic training? And of course, this is a, a ridiculous example, but the question is, how is Fluffy different than a black box machine learning model? Now, the reason that I found the, the, the response by Chief Justice Roberts astounding is because the Chief Justice of the, of, the, of the US Supreme Court is the chief federal regulator of the whole federal court system. There's no separate regulatory agency for, for federal courts. The Supreme Court is the regulatory uh, uh, body for the federal court system, and Chief Justice is the chief reg regulator. And he could say this has to be regulated, but he's taking it very passively. In 2018, Jim Lagos and Chris Hankin wrote, I think, an important uh, uh, column in, this, in, in communication of the ACM, but regulating decision systems. And they wrote, this then for regulation is pervasive throughout the tech industry. In case of autonomous de decision-making, this attitude is mistaken. The widespread adoption of, of AD system will be economically disruptive and will raise complex societal challenges. And, and they say, we should not leave it to industry to come up with the answer. We need to figure out how society should come up with the answer. Now, let me take another example, kind of one of the big things in our life right now, which is the internet. And I want to go back to this ethics versus public policy lens to look at the internet. So you go to the very roots of the internet, and the internet kind of exploded in the, in the, in the mid-90s. That's where it went, became commercial. But the foundation were laid before that. And when I talk about internet, I don't just mean the TCP IP. I'm talking about the whole ecosystem of application and communication applications around the internet. If you go back, when I did my postdoc at Stanford in the early 80s, we had the well, which was a dial bulletin board, was in, if you think about it, it was an early social, social me media application. And there was Usenet, which was a worldwide unit to Unix bulletin board. And so this was the roots of the internet. Now the culture at the time was the counterculture. So we remember, we talk about the 60s in the United States, but the 60s really started in the late 60s as protests against the Vietnam War and continued throughout the 70s. And because of the origin of protests against the Vietnam War, it was very anti-establishment. And it became a cultural movement, the counterculture, the hippies. And uh, out of this counterculture, counterculture came the mantra Information wants to be free. 
Now, information does not want anything. Okay, so this is just a mantra. Information wants to be free. But this became kind of a, from a mantra, it became a dogma. So when Tim Berners-Lee in the late uh, 80s invented the World Wide Web, what does he have in mind? Unfettered public sharing of information. The more, the merrier. And in the early days, when we had suddenly this access to the World Wide Web, it was exhilarating. Wow, look at all this information, so difficult to find before. Now it's all at our fingertips. But very quickly, it wasn't our fingertip. It was huge amounts. How do you find anything on the internet? People struggle, too much information, TMI. And one answer, Yahoo came up with an answer. How do you find books in the library? There is a catalog. Let's have a catalog for the internet. And they went to build a catalog for the internet. But it was going so fast that ultimately it did not scale and Yahoo now is just a, you know, some website that I'm not even sure who owns it right now. So people said, no, 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 we need to do better than that. People came with the idea of search engines. But the first search engine, the problem is, okay, you find, you find many things on a web. How do you show them to the user? What's the order in which to find to show things to the user? The user don't want to go through 10 pages of information. And Google came up with the page rank algorithm was a brilliant idea. I mean, it was just, I remember when it came and you, you click on, I got lucky and you got one, it was one hit and that's what you wanted. And of course it was free because the information wants to be free. You didn't have to pay for search. So Google had to find, okay, how do we monetize? That was the phrase, how do we monetize free information? And they had a brilliant business solution, advertising. They said, how does news, how do newspapers do it? Newspapers are, are cheap relative to the real cost. It's paid by advertising. TV, broadcast TV was free. Advertising, they said, that's what we are going to do, advertising. But then they very quickly realized that online advertising is not very effective. Effectiveness is very low. So what are we going to do? How are we going to have to really make money there? And the answer was micro-targeted advertising. You have to match the ads with individual preference. There was a solution, micro-targeted advertising. And, but for this, we need personal data so we can personalize it, we can target it. So that's how Google had to get into the business of collecting information. And we think the information was, okay, what searches do I run? And what, what did I click on? No, 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 it's much more than that. In fact, it's not only the try to monitor everything you do online, they try to monitor everything you do offline. So just yesterday, I got email from, from Federal Express saying, we changed our privacy policy. We are now going to sell your data. So they can make money. They're going to do that. I went and said, no, no, do not sell my data. Do I really trust them not to do that? Who knows what are the loopholes that are, that are in these 10-page uh, agreements? Who knows what are the loopholes there? So when we talk about machine learning, we think machine learning in the justice system, we don't realize you're interacting with machine learning now dozens of times a day, okay? Every time, every time you open a web page, machine learning decide which ads you're going to see. Every time you are on Facebook, machine learning decide what you're going to what what you're going to see. It's the ranking of a, of a Google search is now goes by is customized to you personally. Machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. The key application of machine learning that you have today is essentially content and advertising moderation on the web. And here is a simple example. Uh, this is from an article I think it was on Slate. They, they run the same search, what is Exxon? And they want to see what advertisement you get. And on one side, they had someone who was, had the profile of being very progressive. And then they go to see beautiful sky and beautiful clouds and all is about carbon capture. And the other one, they created a, a, a conservative persona. And then it was about uh, unnecessary regulation slow our economy down. So which evidence you're going to see depends on which, what Google thinks you are. And that led in 2019, Shoshana Zuboff came up with a thick book, 700 pages called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And in a nutshell, uh, 
This is a furnace that she didn't use, but this is used in Silicon Valley. If you're not paying for it, you are the product. So you use Gmail, it's free. I mean, you're the product. You use Facebook, it's free. You're the product. So that's now the phrase of, it's a, a new model of making money, providing free services. But really the way to make money is by selling data about you to advertisers. Uh, after the January, we hear a lot now every day now, but about uh, now it's even abbreviated J6, J6, after January 6, 2020, uh, 2021, Shoshana Zubo wrote a column in New York Times, the coup we are not talking about. And she wrote, if we, we can have democracy or we can have surveillance capitalism, but we cannot have both. She's arguing is that the surveillance capitalism is a threat, is a direct threat to democracy because these companies now they have this level of knowledge and whoever has knowledge has power and we have no idea where is our data what do they do with it who gets to see it we have no idea in fact after the the in 2021 gizmodo ran a um, a special issue where there are several thought leaders are we living in a tech dystopia and the overwhelming answer the overwhelming overwhelming response overwhelming the responses were yes and this was kind of a, a, a cartoon to try to do it you know after january 6 uh social media kicked trump off twitter and facebook and we all were very thankful to them so this cartoon says thank you for shutting down the insurrection while at the same time big tech is viewed as an octopus sitting on top of Congress. Wired magazine, a review in 2021, complaining that the, the, the British TV show, The Mirror, used to be a dystopia. Now it's a reality show. So let's talk a little bit about Facebook. Facebook took, again, this idea of, a, of a, basically advertising is the business. And, and and the consequence for them was they want to maximize user engagement. And and therefore they have to design the app in such a way that people will stay on it as long as possible. And people now call it addiction by design. In fact, they have viewed they have viewed the way of they have, you know, that like the like. Every time you see that somebody likes you, you get a little a little injection of dopamine. And therefore, it's very hard to get off because you're missing your dopamine. We're all addicted to this to this uh, social approval that we are getting from from social media. And 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 Richard Fried called it the tech industry war on kids. And he said, you know, kids in particular are are obsessed with technology. And he said, what well, the parents don't realize that it happen by having an army of psychologists help Facebook design the apps, help social media design the app, Facebook and, and, and Instagram, and all of these are designed in such a way to have a drug-like power to, sedu to seduce young users, okay? So you think you can take it away from them, you cannot. Uh, I teach a course on, on a computing ethics society at RISE, and one of our project is device abstinence. We ask them to stay away from devices for 24 hours, and then they have to write an essay about their experience. And, you know, in my in my total naivete, I thought they will write about, oh, we had more free time, we went, we smelled the flower, we took, we took walks, we went to chat with our friends. None of that. It was all about fear of missing out. I cannot get in touch with my friend because I don't have my phone. I cannot drive anywhere because I can't find my way. And if you look at the symptoms, they wrote about, and I compare it to, I went and, and look at withdrawal symptoms. They were clearly suffering from withdrawal symptoms, 24 hours. They're all suffering from withdrawal symptoms. And the consequences are, are horrific. I mean, I don't know why this is not, you know, we made, we made a big deal, which is of course, we had incredibly tragic events in, in Texas with, with, a, with a mass shooting. But right now, we have a suicide wave affecting young people. Between 2000 and 2007, suicide rate for people between 10 and 24 was stable. But in the following decade, it increased by 56%. And in 2000 and 
And for ages 10 to 14, it nearly tripled. And I don't know why we are not sitting there and said, this is absolutely horrible. What have we done here? What have we done? Okay, we created these addictive apps and they seem to, you know, people are debating what is causing the current mental health crisis in, among teenagers, but there's wide agreement that social media on, on smartphone plays a key role in it. In particular, we have to remember the iPhone was introduced in 2007 and the Facebook iPhone app in July 2000, in, in, in uh, 2008. And that people say, what otherwise, what explained the tripling of suicide rate between for ages 10 to 14? There's really no other explanation. Now, let's put it aside for a minute. Let's ask on the business side, how well has it worked for, for, for Google and for Facebook? And the answer is, it has worked incredibly well. Look at Facebook now. This is data up to 2020. By now, Google is making more than $150 billion a year just from advertising. It's a huge, huge, huge moneymaker. So suppose we send Sergey Brin and Larry Page to take an ethics bootcamp. Maybe this Institute of, of, of AI Ethics in, in, in Munich, are they going to come back and say, oh my God, surveillance capitalism is, is, not for the, is not for the common good. We have to ditch this business model. Of course, it's not going to happen. We all know that. Now, I wrote in 2019, I said, we shouldn't expect them to abandon the business model because of ethical issue. If society finds the surveillance business model offensive, then the remedy is public policy, the form of laws and regulation, rather than ethics outrage. But, but Google has a problem because it's tried to pretend it's an ethical company. So it put an ethics facade and it has underlying unethical business model. So it's stuck in this contradiction. And this exploded in the Timnit Gebru scandal. Here she made it to the cover of Wired magazine in, in, uh, in June 21. And she was a star engineer who showed that messy AI can spread racism. Google brought her in, then it forced her out. Can big tech take criticism from within? And they, hold, they had a big long article about this. And part of the timeline is that uh, they fired her in, uh, in, uh, in 2020 after they tried to suppress one of her articles. She wrote a, a, an email in response. She got fired. Then uh, other people tried to speak up. Margaret Mitchell got fired. There was a whole uproar inside, inside, uh, inside Google. And in fact, a conference, a, a fate, fate star, fairness, uh, accountability, transparency, explainability, etc., decided in March 21 to suspend Google sponsorship. They said, citing privacy concern, they do not want to have Google as a sponsor. Google says, okay, we will stop tra tracking individually across uh, multiple websites. But it's, it's built to this, this surveillance is built into their DNA. Whatever they're going to tell us, they're going to find, they're going to play with words and find another way of doing it. And, and later in 2021, in the fall, a Wall Street Journal has gotten access to the so-called Facebook papers and made, wrote several scathing articles about Facebook, quoting their internal papers. We make body images to worse for one in 13 girls. We're actually not doing what we are publicly say we do. Misinformation, toxicity, and violent content are inordinately prevalent among researchers, and so on and so forth. So inside Facebook, they, were, they knew what damage they're causing to society, but hey, the company makes tons of money, so they, they wouldn't stop it. Now, there is an argument you keep hearing, oh, well, but we get free services. I heard it all the way to, to from Vint Cerf, who is the in internet uh, evangelist for Google. Yes, we are getting people data, but I get the free services and uh, it's a fair deal. So let's look at these free services. So we saw Google makes $150 billion from advertising. Where does the money come from? So you say, oh no, not for me. I get it. I'm getting Google services for free. So who pays for it? The advertisers pay for it. Who do the advertisers get the money? They're not doing it from their own pocket. They pass the cost. Ultimately, the consumer pays for everything. Ultimately, the consumers pay for it. But we are paying for it in a very indirect way. We have no idea, okay? If you go and you buy whatever you buy, okay? 
how much of it is, how much of what you're paying goes back to advertising. Alex Webb, ironical name, wrote in, in March of 2021, the whole way pays for Google and Facebook to be free. So there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. What we have here is, is a consumer pay for Google services, but in a totally opaque way. It's a hidden tax. We're all paying this hidden tax to support surveillance capitalism. Now, again, the argument is people do it willingly. They know the data is collected. They, will, they, they think it's a fair deal. The answer is, let's go ask people. So for example, people are asked, do you know that, that Facebook has a profile of you? So you can go, if you have Facebook, you can go and click on enough, enough click, 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 and eventually you'll get down to Facebook profile. But it's, a, I don't know, it's at least five clicks away. And 75% of the people don't know that the Facebook have such, a, have such a profile of them. When you show it to them, they say, oh my God, I didn't know that they have it on me. And 27% disagree with, with the Facebook on their profile. I'm actually in a worse position. I think of myself as politically centrist. Facebook said that I'm extremely liberal. And now my dilemma is who is right? Is my self-perception right? Or is Google machine learning right? What am I? Am I a centrist or am I extremely liberal? And you know, we can look at the audience here and ask yourself, okay, probably 95% of you use Gmail. How many of you have read terms of services of, of, of Gmail? If it's 5% here in this audience, I would say it's high. In some more broader audiences, it just you you know we do it auditorium full of people full of people hundred people maybe one or two people would raise their hand most people yes there is a document it's how to read it's full of legalese very few people read it but but the damage in some sense is is to me is even worse so the free market is very imperfect but it does offer mechanism to decide on value. You know, what is the value of my laptop? Well, however much, essentially, however much I'm, I'm, I'm willing to pay for it. So yes, the past, the, of course, there's a cost of producing it, but I bet that the cost of producing it is much cheaper than what I paid for it. The company is making money. And how do they decide what's the value? Market. So the internet with its, with its mantra, information wants to be free, destroyed the concept of information with value. People will pay for information. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we can have a discussion whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But it's an issue of public policy. It not, should not be an ethical of, of ethics. So let's talk a little bit about policy. So why there is very little public policy for information technology. Why not? One is big tech is very big. In January of this year, I estimated that the big five, it's Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook, they had market cap for about $10 trillion. Now, it's, it's probably down by now because the stock market has gone down, but still we're talking about a, a very large and powerful industry. Um, and this industry has lobbied consistently for years against, excuse me, The industry has lobbied for years against regulation under the slogan, again, another mantra, regulation will stifle innovation. In 2018, Elon Musk was being investigated by, by the SEC because SEC claimed that his tweets were attempted to manipulate Tesla stock price. And Wired Magazine, a very techy magazine, jumped and said the case against Elon Musk will chill innovation. So Elon Musk should be exempt from security laws because, because, because innovation. And this partly come, it's not just the power of industry. We are all, we are all guilty there because of the culture that, that's for our community. And that culture is called the techno-utopian culture. And the best embodiment of this 
is a document called the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace that was penned by John Perley Barlow, who went on to found the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Today, they focus mostly on privacy. But this is how it starts. Government of the, of the industrial world, you were a giant of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. So don't come up with your old rules to cyberspace. This is the new home of the mind. As if what happened in cyberspace will stay in cyberspace. Of course, we know that this is not the case. Cyberspace is connected to the physical world. For example, um, a cyber attack on the US power grid. You know, if things got a bit more messier, it's already very messy in the Ukraine, suppose it get even messier. Is it conceivable that, that Russia will attack the US power grid? Absolutely. And what you do is already saw that there is evidence that, that Russian hackers are, have tried to, to, to penetrate the US electric power grid. And the techno-utopian culture gave rise to the disruption culture. And in, in, uh, in 1995, Clayton Christensen coined the phrase disruptive innovation. And he, he described how each wave of technology disrupted the previous existing technology. And he was trying to be just descriptive. He showed how every new wave of this technology replaces the previous uh, uh, technology. But since then, disruption has become a Silicon Valley mantra. Uh, New York Times, uh, uh, Hefferman wrote, ennobling destruction and sabotage makes the most brutal form of capitalism seem like God's will. So disruption has come, come from uh, uh, something descriptive to something prescriptive. Oh, let's, let's disrupt, disruption is good. And disruption led to breaking. Facebook's slogan until 2014 was move fast and break things. Unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. Let's break things. Let's move fast and break things. And in fact, we now know that Facebook frictional sharing has all kinds of negative effects. Facebook said, go ahead, do it. Move fast, break things. But what are they going to break? If they want to break Facebook travel re reimbursement system, I don't care, but we now know that they are they they, pre, they they chose growth over safety, and that led to almost breaking democracy. We now know that social media played a key role in in our losing democracy, almost losing democracy, and the hearing that we are hearing uh, just this week, we are getting a view of how close we were to really losing democracy. This was very close. A few people stuck their fingers in the dam and saved US democracy. We were very, very close. And social media played a key role. So should we hold this corporation responsible? What does it mean for corporation to be responsible? So you go back to 1960s and you ask the CEO, whom are you responsible for? And they will say, oh, I have responsibility. I will... You know, I have social responsibility. I have many stakeholders, shareholder, customer, employee, community. You know, I mean, I have many, I have to navigate. You say it's complicated. I have to navigate many interests. But then since, since uh, 1980, shareholder value became the dogma on Wall Street. And you have only one responsibility to, to enrich the shareholders. And it goes back to a very influential article by Milton Friedman in 1970. The sole responsibility of business is to increase its profit. That's it. It's just about money. Nothing else matters. And the result has been so negative that the business roundtable, which is the organization of the top, roughly 250 top CEOs in the United States, say, no, 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 no. This, will, this damages everybody. Let's go back to stakeholders. We'll have to see how well it's going to work out. But the business roundtable acknowledged that shareholder responsibility was a huge mistake. So let me try to conclude. Technology is driving the future. But who is steering? Who is doing the steering? And right now the answer is tech corporations are doing the steering. They deploy technology. There are no regulation. They decide on the ground rules. Technology has moved fast. Public policy is lagged behind. The argument has been, oh, innovation. But innovation is not a goal. 
it is means for societal progress. We should evaluate uh, innovation, but how well does it do what it's supposed to do? Sometimes it does a very good job, pulls people out of poverty. That's very good. In some cases, it does. It has many negative effects. We must address it. And Benjamin Applebaum wrote a column and this anniversary of the Milton Friedman article, and he said, we're blaming corporation. He said, that's the wrong thing. It should not be corporation. Instead of redefining the role of corporation, we need to refine the role of the state. And he said, yes, neoliberalism criticized the state, but he said government remain the most powerful means to express our collective will. This is what democracy is about. What do we want to accomplish as, as a society? And if we want corporations to behave better, it shouldn't depend on their goodwill. We should establish the ground rules and the incentive and the penalties to make sure the corporations behave responsibly. Now, let's me just a, a few a few points on ethics versus public policy. Am I saying that ethics is not important? Of course not. The wrong call starts with all human beings are born free and equal dignity and rights. Of course, I agree with this. In fact, ethics should inform public policy. Chief Justice Errol Warren has a famous quote in civilized life. The law floats in a sea of ethics. Ethics is what we based our values on, okay? But the law is institutionalized. We have the justice system. We don't have the ethics system. Without, eth without laws and regulation, ethics is a subject of philosophy books. It doesn't really offer guidance for modern society. Now, I teach a course at RICE, a co-teach course on committing ethics and society, and I want my students to learn about ethics. But again, at the end of the day, if we, if we want our society to function better, we need to take ethics and translate it into laws and regulation. And it seems that regulation is coming. There seems seem to be broad, broad agreement. In fact, the best signal is when a whole bunch of CEOs are saying, we need regulations. And it's clear that they think it's coming. They just try to influence what shape it will take. And I'm not trying to say the regulation is easy. I think regulation is very hard. One, you have to have good governance. If you have take a corrupt country, you know, I talk, I gave a talk on this in for a conference in Romania, and they laughed. They said, more regulation, more opportunities for bribery. They did not trust the government in their country to be able to enforce regulation. And there are different, different between culture, different cultures. Uh, some topics are big, they need international treaties. And there's one huge issue that we must put on the table, is big tech too big? Tim Wu wrote in, in, in 2018, be afraid of, of bigness, be very afraid. Now he's part of the, of, the, of the Biden administration. Will something be done, for example? Facebook bought Instagram and WhatsApp to suppress competition. This should have never been approved. Should we force them now to cough up and spin off Instagram and WhatsApp? And the biggest, to me, the biggest challenge is what I call the social trilemma. Emily Basel wrote in the New York Times, why is big tech policing speech? Because the government isn't. We're uncomfortable with the government suppressing speech. We're uncomfortable with Silicon Valley doing it. We're also, also uncomfortable with nobody doing it. Do we want to have social media rife with misinformation and, and racism and calls for violence? What do we do about it? And in fact, even Facebook doesn't know what to do about it. They said no violence, but when people call for violence against Russian, Russian invader, oh, that's okay, this is good violence. So should Facebook be the arbiter of good violence versus bad violence? This is the social trilemma, and I don't have a magical answer to how we do this. So let's conclude again by the question, who drives technology? Tristan Green wrote an article in 2020, and he said, when we, when we talk about the ethic of AI, we're asking two simple questions. Is it ethical to build AI for this specific purpose? And is it, eth build, is it ethical to build AI with these capabilities? I think these questions do not go far enough. I would say, who benefits and who decides? Kate Crawford, in similar spirit, wrote, stop talking about AI ethics. It is time to talk about power.
who makes decision. And I'll finish with a slogan that I'm stealing from BMW. BMW, the slogan used to be the ultimate driving machine. And now by, by, they're being threatened by, by AVs. So the new slogan is don't be driven by technology, drive it. And I think this slogan is appropriate for us as a society. We should not be driven by, by technology. We should drive technology. We should drive technology. Thank you very much. Thanks, Moshe, for an a interesting and provocative talk. Uh, talk. I, I, you raised a lot of questions, and I think there's much to discuss. Um, why don't we, we open to the floor to questions now? Um, you can either raise your hand in the chat, uh, in, the, in the Zoom feature, or David can help moderate questions in the room. I think Konstantin, Konstantin had his hand raised. No, I was just clapping. Oh, clapping. OK. That's OK. Yeah. OK. It looks like we've got a question from the chat. Room. Yeah, I see, I see, I see okay. several comments on the chat. Yeah. Is that Dana well, or David? Do you want to? I have a question. I don't have any hope for a regulation if the Supreme Court can negate the New York State laws against open carry and if it takes 30 years for Congress to pass any reasonable laws about gun control, how can there be regulation in our political system today? So I can give a whole talk. I'm working on another talk, and it's called Technology and Democracy. And it kind of deals, in some sense, with this question. And I would say right now, you're asking a very good question. I don't have, I don't have a, a, a magical formula. I think the, the, the problem is much worse than just we cannot pass regulation. We have a, a deeply polarized society right now. And it's polarized to the extent, you know, the, the Texas GOP just passed a new platform. It's a new platform they're calling for passing a referendum on secession from the United States. I doubt that this, that this would pass in Texas still, but even the fact that it's on the GOP platform makes you want to tear your hair off, whatever is left on your head. So how did we end up with a society that is, that is so polarized? Yeah, I see somebody said society is not polarized. I disagree, I disagree. I have a, I have a, I mean, there are people who knew and they've become Trumpist. And I have a difficulty even having, have, you know, I'm struggling with still having any respect for them. Because people fall into that thing, they, the people call fall into, into, into Fox News and they just don't come out. I mean, it's impossible to have a, a conversation. I think it's a, you call it the media is polarized uh, or, or a, yeah, they have, okay, Fox News, and then you have Max News, and uh, and what is it, America One, you can find even more. Fox News is, you think Fox News is the most right-wing? No, 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 they are even more right to the to the right of, uh, of Fox News. But uh, our society right now feels like a broken society. And how do we, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. How do we, how do we fix Humpty Dumpty back again? And how did it happen? I think this is kind of a deep question. How did we end up? with such a dysfunctional society. And um, I, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's a very long, long topic and I, I, I won't go into that. And the, it's a question for all of us is, how do we put this society back together? Without, you know, democracy require some level of societal cohesion because, if, because politics require compromise. And if, if it's us versus them, then there's just no willingness to compromise. And there has to be agreement that we all play by the same rules. We follow the rules of the game. And we are not willing to play by the rules of the game. Then it all become, you know, I mean, the big lie or how you believe it or you don't believe it. But uh, I think then you're asking a very good question. But I think the question you're asking is, is bigger than just regulation. How do we take our democracy to just function as a democracy. Right now, our democracy is dysfunctional. They may be able to pass some government, some regulation when the bipartisan agreement on it, but it's become more and more difficult to pass 
any kind of, of uh, law generally. Yanis has a question. Yanis? Yes. Um, well, a few comments. I think you make an assumption. So, for example, for the election, you said January 6 was the threat to democracy. Well, actually, January 6 was the most democratic thing that can happen because people <laughs> petition, exercise their constitutional right to petition their government. And we say that's a threat to, to democracy. However, election fraud, nobody says, well, how, how do people know that election fraud has not happened? How, how do you know unless you go and you examine every single ballot? You don't. So I'm not saying it happened or didn't happen, but many people have credible doubts about the election integrity. So you are telling me that election integrity is not a threat to democracy, but uh, petitioning your government is. I think that's a statement that a tyrant uh, would make. But you don't think of yourself as promoting tyranny, but quite often they say the road to hell is paved with the best of intentions. So that's the, the first point. The second point has to go with the role of the state and corporations, okay? Corporations wouldn't be what they are without state giving them the legitimacy and the power to become so. So the, the same goes, and, and, and that applies to, 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 to government. Uh, to me, uh, having an oligarchical, bureaucratic government is the antithesis to, 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 to democracy. Now you have unelected government officials going and tampering and changing the vote of people. It's, it's unbelievable. And uh, can so, you have, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for you to give a separate talk, but uh, since this, this is so, Q, so, since so Q and A, these two issues, yeah, these two issues government is, is government antithetical to, to, to democracy and how we can uh, work that out because we haven't been able to, 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 to work it out. Thank you for your comments, Yanis. Uh, David. Hello. Um, thanks for the talk. So for me, I, I think I'm hearing kind of a distinction between government and governance. And there's government regulation, which is one thing that you've been promoting. And there's also the idea of having better governance. And somehow I want to distinguish between these because our government might be this uh, old, you know, flesh weary thing of flesh and steel that people are rightly feeling is somehow not taking the wheel properly. And then there's the idea of some kind of governance where we are able to kind of account for our own like greed or our own um, willingness to step on others or whatever in some system where we can be honest about that and to be able to have those conversations. I feel like those, instead of ethics training, something like uh, better language for governance of the things we care about is feel still different than government. I'm wondering about your comments on that. So government is, is a bit of ambiguous word. If you look at English, what government means, it's the act of governing, governing. But we have become in popular use, the way we use government is the organization that governs. That's what we call the government. Governance is the act of governing, okay? And the two things are, of course, connected to the hip, okay? Now, in principle, you can have a very legitimate government, but for example, it might be paralyzed, I mean, Israel just uh, disbanded. Israel has just disbanded. It's a it's a coalition. It goes to the fourth election, fourth or fifth election, I think, in a, in in four years. So you you have a, you have a government, but governance is impaired for whatever reasons. Uh, some people look at uh, at uh, Singapore as an example of a somewhat more authoritarian government, but rather still a good governance. So. They're not identical things, but let's just separate. The government is the organization, and governance is the act of governing and, and governing our society. That's how I meant them. They are not, they are not separable, but they should not be conflated. Now there is there is a, just talking about imperfection of our of, of our government and governance. There is to me one of the most profound sentences in the U.S. Constitution is the first sentence. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, not a perfect union, a more perfect union. So the framer, the, the, the framer realized that 
this is this is what we're doing is a human enterprise and uh, you can go back to the biblical story chapter one god stand there and like a production of cecile de mille let there be light let there be this and the, and the star and everything and then uh, pretty soon there after he brings two humans into the picture he lose controls of the plot so humanity has been messy from the get-go and they said all we can hope is to have a more perfect union not a perfect union we have to continue to strive for improvement thanks okay i'm going to use moderator privilege to sneak in one last question and then we'll, we'll uh and formally end the proceedings and we'll have a post talk off the record discussion um but my, my final question is simply um many you know your, your own work too, Moshe, but many of people involved in this organization community are scientists and technologists. Um, and you've spoken about technology driving the future uh, and uh, an understanding of regulation as part of the, the process of achieving the future we want as a society. Um, what role do technologists or scientists have to play in this, this future? Um, and what can we do? So I, I think that... We need to engage in a conversation with people with whom we don't usually talk. One is, the, the big thing is that you look at the last uh, um, kind of 30 years, the thing that we all miss is going to be the societal impact of computing. For example, we said uh, sharing is good. So frictionless sharing should be better. Let's reduce friction, okay? We did not try to take people who, I mean, I, I, never, I don't claim that I have a deep understanding of humanity. I mean, I mean, I came to computer science because I was a nerd and I stayed a nerd, okay? But we missed the, the concept of what will happen when you take a technology and you scale it up, okay? And I mentioned Usenet before. And in fact, what happened, Usenet used to be when I was a postdoc, Using it was a fantastic thing. You had a question, you had a discussion, you know. And then midnight is the internet went commercial, and suddenly there were many, 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 many more users joined the fray. And the signal to noise ratio went dramatically down. And within a couple of years, I said, this is this is just a waste of time. Too much noise there, waste of time. So what happened? Too many players. Okay. There is a difference. I grew up on a kibbutz in Israel, and I didn't have a key as a child, because we never locked the house. There was no need to lock the house. And uh, now I live in Houston, and not only we lock the house, but we have an alarm system and monitoring company. So there is something about, we did not think about what happened when you scale technology to a large number of users. We missed it. There are people who understand it better than us. Would they have predicted it? I don't know. There are people who understand regulation. I said, there are tricky parts about regulation. I am not an expert on regulation. And I said, regulation, uh, regulation can be too heavy-handed. Regulation can be too light-handed. There are people who study this. It's a, it's, just, it's a topic of study. There are people who study this. They don't always understand the technology. And so we need to engage with them. I mean, ACM has started now an initiative just in the last few months called Tech Briefs. They take a topic. The first one was, for example, uh, inform ICT, Information Communication Technology and, and Climate Change. And they talk about the technology issues and the policy issues. So we need to talk to people. We are, I, most of us, I know starting with me, are not expert in, in regulation, but very often the regulatory people, and I mean, there are two types, the regular, the regular the regulation scholars, and of course there are, there are policy thinkers and policy makers. And we have not engaged in a conversation. There are the political side of this, there are what is effective regulation, it's time to broaden the conversation. If we leave it to us to manage it, we made a mess of things, we'll continue to make mess of things. At least we start listening to people who have a broader understanding of, of society. Okay, thank you. That's a, a wonderful answer, I think, and a start for, for more work to be done and a, a constructive conversation. So let's thank Moshe once again. Is there a symbol for that? Oh, yeah, symbol. Um. No, I don't have a symbol for, for doing this. Okay, I block to my calendar. We can stay for another.